Hey there, entrepreneur, and welcome to today's show. I am joined by David Perry, who is the CEO of Caro, a new e-commerce partnership network used by over 30,000 Shopify brands. GetCaro.com helps brands gain attention, sales, and new customers by partnering with other brands in the network. David also has a little bit of a history in the video game industry, folks, where Sony PlayStation acquired his previous company to establish leadership in the future of streaming video games from the cloud. And the service is now called PlayStation Now, you know, in case you hadn't heard of that, folks, right? So David, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for inviting me. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited. I mean, number one, I watched your TED talk from like 10 years ago the other day, um, and it was really, really cool. I like. You want to know something? Through. You want to know something funny about that TED talk? I was incredibly ill. Like when I say <laughs> ill, I left the stage and went and threw up outside. I was, I had, I had stomach flu, and I had this really interesting problem. Is you, you know, how how hard is it to get invited to speak on the main TED stage? Yeah, yeah. And so you'd say to yourself, well. You know, I, I have no choice here. I literally have to go on stage no matter how bad I feel. And so I had given them a bottle of of, of like Gatorade um, to drink so I could at least stay hydrated while I was yeah. doing it. And uh, and when I got on stage, that was gone as well. So I was just on my own. <laughs> it was terrible. You're like, uh, open a prayer here, kids. Open a prayer. <laughs> terrible. Um, but yeah, I literally, I missed the whole show. So I didn't go to the whole show before my speech. I, I showed up, did my speech, then went and threw up outside, and then and then just went back to my hotel room and died. It was yeah. it was the worst. It's kind of well, funny, but but made I, it look but good. I got the- you made it look good, and I feel like I learned a lot too. And it was some, and it was nice to see because again, it was from like when was it? Like it was early. It was a long time ago. Five or something like that. Yeah, it was something long like that. And for me, it was like it was very cool to see all the tech stuff um, that you were walking yeah. people through in that. But but anyways, we digress. So high five for making it through that TED talk. Um, but tell us about, you know, we're all about adversity here and helping folks get through things. So can you tell us about a time, you know, when you faced adversity, and what resilience tools you kind of use to get through it? Anything from your past? Well, actually, I I would say um, um, that. You know, it's always interesting as you move forward. I would say the adversity we're we're facing for my current um, company is really quite significant. Um, you know, in in a normal situation, it would probably just destroy your company. Um, it, you know, while while you're trying to build a business, um, you know, we're we're in a business where it's all about in, in e-commerce. Like coming from the game industry, it's kind of odd for me to come into e-commerce, but I. I'm finding it fascinating. I think this it's like the wild west. There's so much opportunity. It <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, but you know, the, we had this, this whole thing with, uh, you know, a tariffs being put on international goods. And then we had a global pandemic, you know, this is while I'm trying to build a company. Um, <laughs> then, then the supply chain completely collapses. I mean, I, I live by, um, down in California and I literally can see the ships along the, the coastline just parked, you know, and, uh, so the supply chain died on us. Um, and then Apple decided to change privacy um, so that uh, advertising would become less effective. And that, you know, sort of really hurt the brands that are trying to, to make money uh, in the space. And uh, and that that the result of that is increased customer acquisition costs, which, as you know, can really hurt brands. Yeah. And then we started a war. Um, well, are we got we we joined into a war in Ukraine, which doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon. Mm-mm. And then we had a full stock market crash and a cryptocurrency market crash, which is, by the way, when you're trying to raise money from investors is not a good thing, not a fun situation. And then the the investors start devaluing startups. um, And then we've now entered a technical recession. And uh, and now we're we're, we have another possible pandemic with this uh, with monkeypox coming in. And uh, and now all the tech companies are purging staff. And there's a chance there's going to be bankruptcies and mortgage defaults. And so this has been the most turbulent, crazy situation, just trying to build a company, you know, as you do, because yep. what's next? Like, what are we going to deal with next? And, and and trying to keep everyone focused in the same direction. I think the one thing we feel lucky about is is what the, the platform that we're building is really there to try to help brands get more attention and more sales. And, um, you know, in a kind of a a new way and in doing so, 
it means that that it's it's actually needed more than ever the worse it gets <laughs> right so, so the worse that that's handy gets, you know the, the they're going to get out let's say advertising just gets harder and harder and more and more expensive then then they they need attention in other ways um if they uh, you know if the if if things just if they need more sales dramatically like we have to increase sales now or we have to we have to get more margin now um then we're a great platform for that but the the, the concept we had was really simple which I, I, and this is what i mean with with uh with e-commerce is today if you're at retail and let's say you make a product that's really cool some some um i don't know some new food or something like that that's very cool and you get it into whole foods you're everyone's high-fiving each other this is huge success why because you're getting whole foods attention for free and then you get target oh my god we get target or you get costco or something else incredible because you're getting your products into more retail outlets um there isn't the equivalent of that on on e-commerce where someone's helping you get your products into all of these different stores so right. that you can enjoy their traffic as well for free for as long as you can maintain the relationship. And that's the way it works in retail. Yeah. You've got to stay friends with Whole Foods and stay friends with, with Target. But if you do, you get to enjoy their, their, uh, their traffic for as long as, as you can keep the relationship. And so we decided to build that online. Like why, why doesn't someone do that and help? And we have over 30,000 brands installed now. And so this is why this is kind of an interesting thing for us is how, how much more free attention would you like for your products? If you're, if you, if you have products yeah. or alternatively, if you're selling products, um, have you ever thought about, um, what, what you, you, you can't, most brands don't have, have everything they need on their store. They tend to, they tend to sell the stuff they make. Um, like I make bicycles well, I don't make helmets, so I'm not going to sell helmets. Right. But hold on a minute. That means they're going to go to Amazon to buy their helmets. Um, are you sure you didn't want to sell helmets on your site? Because we can give you great helmet companies today. Right. And uh, and you and you can partner with them. So yeah. effectively, what we ended up doing was creating a dating service. Honestly, it's like a brand-to-brand -brand dating. They, they uh, find each other. Um, either they already know each other or they find each other and then they, they, they both opt in and say, yeah, I'd like to work with this other um, entity. And, and suddenly the bike store has, doesn't just have the helmets. They actually have all of the helmets from the helmet company. So every, every color, every size, yeah. um, and they don't have to pay anything for, um, for stocking those products. So that's, awesome. that's why we found this a, a sort of a fun opportunity. And you can see how that helps even when you're facing enormous, um, headwinds from all kinds of different dimensions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're spot on when you say that the last couple of years have been, you know, interesting to say the least. So how have you as kind of a CEO of this company while you're building, how have you personally been able to kind of keep yourself moving and overcome the adversity personally, as well as keep a team moving through it? I think for me, it's, um, it's a case of, of believing that what you're doing is going to make a difference and then keep actually climbing the mountain. It's a bit like, um, you know, that saying, how do you eat, eat an elephant one bite at a time? Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you climb a mountain is one step at a time. It's a bit like that where we're, we're clear on where we're going. Um, it's a very technically complicated thing to solve. Um, and, you know, it's in a way um, I like to be at the tip of the spear. So whenever there's a new initiative, we're right there at the bleeding edge of it. And that means that you come to work every day saying, how are we going to solve that? Like that, that hasn't been solved yet. So we have to actually solve it. Um, yeah. uh, you know, and it's, it's sometimes not so obvious. There's things like um, all the brands when they make their own stores, just design their store and categories and whatever, any way they feel like there's no, there's no rules. Yeah. Um, so, so they just do whatever they want, which means, you end up with 30,000 stores all done any way they want. And so then you say, well, I'd like to search across all those stores. Well, you can't, that, right. that's not a thing. So then we have to invent that. Like, how do you search across them in a really easy way? Um, and that means hiring a team in the Philippines um, to help us um, teach our machine learning and computer vision to start recategorizing 30,000 stores. And it's, just, you know, it's like about a million, it's about a million products in total. Wow. And, and as we continue to grow, you know, so you see what I mean? You, you sort of every, every day we're like, well, how are we going to solve that? Well, that's a whole thing. We got to go solve that in a, in a, in a scalable 
way so we can yeah. end up with you know tens of millions of products and so um that's the fun part i think is it never gets boring i, I think we can <laughs> hire just about anyone from any company because you know you you meet somebody really important at a at a large company um they, you know the technical director or something like that and and i i call it washing the dishes so when you're in a really large corporation very commonly you reach a point where you're just washing the dishes it feels like you're coming to work every day you're not inventing anymore yeah you're not getting to create anything new anymore you're just keeping this whole machine going and um and so those people when you talk to them you're like wouldn't you like to get back in the you know you know every day creating new things and inventing um, and, and honestly, they thrive on that. So it's it becomes quite easy to find talent um, if you're doing something that's kind of innovative. And, and that's where um, coming from the game industry, if you're not doing something innovative, you're dead. Yeah. I mean, it's just the it's over. Like if you're not making a game that people haven't experienced yet and want to experience, if you're just like copying everybody else, that's not going to work. Yeah. Um, so um, I think that's a, it's good training. And those are great engineers to bring into, into modern software companies because they're, they're commonly game engineers tend to be able to, um, you know, always imagine a way to solve a, a creative way to solve a problem yeah. um, where if you just have formal programming um, education, quite commonly, you'll just say, well, you can't do that. That's not possible. There's, you know, it's too Why? much data. Why not? Right. Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I just, I just gave a talk earlier today to a bunch of um, CEOs and like startup founders, and they're all kind of tech, you know, ish or in the science space or something like that. And, and, you know, one of the things that we were talking about is one of the keys has got to be creativity. You cannot be a static thinker, you know, if you're going to come into this innovative play space. Right. But on the flip side of that, they were saying too, that when you're always kind of solving, 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 you can get burnt out. So how are you avoiding that? Yeah, no, that's a real problem too. Is if if everything is a mountain, <laughs> you like you get to the top you're of the tired. mountain, yeah. and then you just see another <laughs> mountain range in the distance. Yeah, yeah um, I I think overall we try our, our best to keep it um, to keep it fun as well. Um, I personally, I'm finding it interesting because my daughter, I have a daughter. She's uh, she's about to be 18, but but you know, over the last couple of years, you can imagine. Um, if I'm talking about the video game industry, she's not that terribly interested. But when I'm talking about brands and e-commerce and celebrities and influencers, suddenly it actually is is kind of cool. So yeah. I I, I kind of like learning about this whole new space, and um, and I think um, in a way where we keep uncovering more and more layers of what needs to be solved, um, and so we're finding by building this sort of a honeypot of brands that's actually now drawing in large um, entities that that, that uh, if you, for example, if you were to go to univision.com, you'll see they have a shop button. Um, the entire thing is powered by us. And so the idea um, of large entities coming in saying, look, we want to have a lot of, a lot of access to a lot of products. Well, that's what we do. So we can easily make that happen. And, um, and so that's really exciting for brands because it's giving them entirely new paths to sales that just didn't exist before. So the brands that are in Cairo can now be sold live on television on Univision um, at no cost. So would you like to be live on television? We can do that. Um, and so that's just one of the the relationships we have now. And so um, I think that keeps it interesting. I don't I don't think we're I don't think we're just grinding and just doing just this one thing. The the, the deals that we're getting and the, the relationships we're building I think are kind of fun and fascinating. Mm -hmm. And trying to work out how you would do that deal, but um, I do believe as well in in uh, in in the game industry. I I used to love to talk about what I'm experiencing because I get to be in certain rooms and things that, that a lot of the, the the sort of up and coming game developers haven't experienced yet. And yeah. so I love yeah. to share here. Here's what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. Here's what I'm hearing. Yeah. And uh, I think it's the same in, in this space as well. A, a good example being influencers, I think, are becoming brands and I think brands are becoming influencers. And mm -hmm. so there's this weird crossover that's happening right now where influencers are realizing that this this vanity number of followers sounds really great, but it's actually not as great as having customers. Right. So yeah. having customers is a real metric. And yeah. everyone that's a billionaire as an influencer is has got lots and lots of customers that have moved over from being followers 
And and yet I would say less than one percent of influencers have realized this yet. There's really? less than one percent have, have made the that move. Is, that's like marketing 101. Like if you can't convert, like then it's yeah. then it's fake, <laughs> right? Like yeah. you know, right. I mean, I think a lot of people think that. And I think that's at least in like the solopreneur space, like that is a huge thing. Like we all kind of know that that you can have, you know, people can buy followers, keep, you know, if they're not converting or if you know, your engagement metrics aren't high, then it's useless. So good job. One number is high, but the rest of them are low and you're not making any money. So then you're just putting content out based on yourself. And you're also not tapped into your users either. Like you haven't done your market research or your homework on that to know that you're producing content that actually is engage worthy, <laughs> engagement worthy. Yeah. yeah. To know your customers really trust you with like what yeah. are, what do they really trust you with and and here's the point is is when they start to create their own customers they end up controlling some real estate that brands will fight over right let's say you're great at selling e-bikes you imagine how many e-bikes want to be in that real estate like yeah. i've sold a hundred thousand e-bikes well well damn um you're gonna have people fighting to get into that real estate yeah. and giving you better and better deals a typical um affiliate uh, fee if you go to somewhere like Amazon is about three to five percent and yeah. and uh, you know sometimes they'll do codes and um you know special UTM links and things like that to try to make some money but it's always they're always treated as an affiliate which means right. um we'll get thanks for the sale but we're keeping the customer exactly. Amazon yeah. does the same thing everyone does uh, you know here's yeah. here's a little bit of money and by the way we'll keep the customer mm -hmm. I even see influencers get excited because they've signed a merch deal but when you look into it, it's like, yeah, but you don't get to keep the customer. Um, yeah. and, and so ultimately, um, that's the, that's the path for them. And if they, if they do it this way, what they actually become is the retailer and they get the retailer cut, not the affiliate cut, the actual right. retailer right. cut retailer. and the retailer yeah. cut is generally 20 to 50%, depending on the, the product category, yeah. which is just profoundly more, but most important, they end up, uh, owning, owning actual customers. And yeah. so what you find is when you look back to brands, you go, well, if brands are becoming influencers, how does that work? Well, what we see is, is their website has this beautiful table with cutlery and nice plates and a beautiful um, dinner recipe using their spaghetti. And all they sell is the spaghetti, but I want, I want this experience, right? I want that for dinner. That looks fantastic. Yeah. What is that? And then they have recipes, but they don't sell anything in the recipes, just the spaghetti. And Someday, when they expand their company, they're going to add a fourth color of spaghetti. Um, like that's their future expansion plans. Yeah. And you're like, are you serious? Like this no, is the other stuff. you. You yeah. should be thinking about. You should be taking every single dollar that's that, that you're inspiring should be heading your direction. A really good example is um, there's a, a company called Blendjet that makes. You know, this is they've sold. I think they're in twenty thousand stores at this point. They're an enormous uh, company, consumer electronics company, selling portable blenders. And the idea is that when you're, when you're about to drink, you can blend it, which means it never settles. You're, you're always drinking it yeah. fully, uh, fully blended. Um, but here's the point is if you're a consumer electronics company like them, they're on blend yet too. At some point that means they have to try to convince everyone to buy blend yet three. Cause that seems like the natural path is, is get everyone to rebuy. But um, when they came to us, we said, well, why don't, why don't we help you build a marketplace so you can sell everything that goes in a blender? And, and you know, you don't need to worry about refrigerated warehousing and perishable goods and all that. It, it, that is just partner with all the companies. And of course, they're because they're so big, everybody wants to work with yeah. them. So the Oatleys and everyone are working with them through our platform. And so now they have a full marketplace of products. But the, the the funny part is then they add, they added um, subscriptions. So now they're selling subscriptions to protein powders yeah. that they, you know, that, that, that are from partners. Um, and, and that's just such an interesting way to start to, because now they can do recipes and work with influencers and everything else, um, uh, you know, creating interest for what goes into their consumer electronics product. Yeah. And so... That's the fun part is watching uh, entrepreneurs sort of take advantage of, of new technology and, um, and and seeing what they do with it. Yeah. And I mean, as entrepreneurs too, I mean, I think you can get, especially if you have a single product like that, you do get very linear focused, right? And mm -hmm. like, like you said, you know, here's release one, here's release two, here's release three. And you forget 
especially to your earlier point when you were saying like, you know, people are buying the experiences. That's why the VRBOs of the world and the Airbnbs of the world are, you know, going through the roof because people want the experience of, of that thing. And I think that's really interesting how you put that spaghetti model out there saying like, no, I don't just want the damn spaghetti. Like I want the whole freaking thing. So uh, why can't we, and I don't want to have to go to six <laughs> places to get it. Right. Like, so why yeah. can't I get it right here? But I think it's interesting for our entrepreneurs listening to say, you know, to be thinking outside of the box and not to be saying like the linear path that you thought that you would be selling on is there's way more promise behind it is what you're saying, right? Way more, you know, potential to be making it's, money than you could ever have dreamed of nowadays. And there used to be. It's literally every day here. Um, I'll give you another example is someone said, um, would you talk to the the CEO of a company that, that helps, uh, give you an emergency call with a vet and i'm like hmm but that's an app we don't really do anything yeah. with apps and then we're like but hold on a minute first of all the, 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 she said to me look our problem is that vets keep recommending products like like you know beds and leashes and all kinds of things and we don't want to have an, any warehouse full of dog products or yeah. pet products can you just help us with that and the answer is of course we can but then she said you know, we do this emergency call with a vet and then the discussion turned into, well, what if you were to create a new digital SKU, like an actual product that says emergency call with a vet, and you can actually then push that into all the pet stores in the network. Huh. Um, so effectively, now you've created something out of nothing that yeah. that, that, that um, becomes experiential in a way. So that could yeah. be tickets to something, the entrance to something, spend time with somebody, but you're actually pushing it into all the stores where that would make sense. And yeah. so it can even go into bundles. So we have bundle tech as well that allows you to put multiple products like an all day skincare regime or something like that. But you could yeah. also do a new puppy pack that comes with an emergency call uh, if you need okay. to talk to a vet, like in yeah. an emergency. Um, and it's this stuff that doesn't really exist today that to me seems like the wild west. There's just so yeah. many opportunities when you start to think about, well, what, 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 if, if, what skew could you invent and then that other people would want to stock in their stores? And why don't you create that now and start partnering with all those stores? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm even thinking like brick and mortar type stuff too. Like no offense to you. Cause I think, I think what you're doing is amazing, but on the brick and mortar, my, my mind went to like, if I'm a target, if I'm an REI, if I'm, you know, any of the, any of the stores that are selling things that have active wear in it, anything like that, you know, where's the experience that you can throw on that as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Like why can't there be a combination to your point, if you're going to sell, weights or a yoga mat or something like that why can't you have a skew for a free online class you know that's a whole yeah. other thing right yeah we we a hundred percent and we see really interesting ones um sometimes like there's a great uh, company called paper like mm -hmm. that actually um you know the way you can draw on the surface of like an ipad um yeah. or a tablet and yep. it doesn't feel like paper it feels like slidey glass yeah so they actually sell um this uh, sheet that goes over the over the the device and it makes it makes it feel like you're actually drawing on paper. That's super cool. But then they go, well, people actually need a stand to put that on, and yeah. the stand costs more. Just to be clear, the stand's more expensive than the than the the, the actual product that you make and sell. Yeah. And so every time they sell a stand, their average order value goes up a lot. And so that's been a very interesting um, piece of it as well. Is is the complementary products that just makes sense. You can imagine a lot of people are just going to add that to the cart because they want that as well. Because uh, yeah. it, it sort of makes sense to make the product work better. Um, yeah. Do you really want that bigger sale going off to Amazon or something like that? It just doesn't make any sense. And no. so, no. Um, and, and so we just, again, it's, it's in all dimensions and we're just sort of watching from above to see the behavior and, and see what people uh, sort of learn and work out as they go. But yeah. that's why, you know, going back to your question before, like, does it get monotonous or do you get stuck in the, you know, it's just this endless grind? Uh, not really at all. It's more, um, I, I love this um, kind of creativity that comes out of it, seeing what yeah. people do when you give them new technology and the questions they come back with and the, the features they want. Yeah. Um, so we're really building it for them. So to some extent, it's kind of fascinating to see what they ask for. Yeah. Can we go back for a second to the question when you said that you had to send it over to the Philippines to kind of templatize mm. or streamline everything? Um, how are you scaling something like this when, when shops have their own kind of wild west backends? Is it because yes. you kind what of you do is you create a data science team that, that creates an algorithm that will go through and look at each product and recategorize it. Okay. And those algorithms tend to be about 80 to 90% correct. 
Um, but they're always, especially with new products they've never seen before, they're going to get it wrong. And yeah. so um, there's this sort of concept in, 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 um, in engineering between it's called supervised learning versus unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning is like, yeah, I got it wrong, whatever. Like it's doing pretty <laughs> no. good. If then there's no me. accountability. Yeah. <laughs> like 80%, it's pretty damn good. Um, yeah. And then supervised learning means, okay, of the ones you got wrong, um, let's fix those. And, and then the system can learn what they are for the future. Yeah. And so that's because it's so many products. Um, we, we just, we, we have a sort of a scalable resource overseas, um, and the, you know, this will quite happy to, to correct it and teach it. And, and that's what they do. That's fantastic. No, my operate, I do like a lot of like operational excellence and like that stuff's in my head. So when I heard, you know, that much of a like <laughs> discrepancy between all the things, like on the back end, like it made me kind of nauseous, not going to lie, like thinking how yeah. the hell you would scale something, you know, to the, to the rate in which you've scaled it. But that's really, that's a really cool approach to it. Um, to standardize. So what are some kind of last things if you have somebody who's kind of a leader in this, you know, wild west, regardless of what the industry is, but you're coming into this, you're leading into the unknown territory, it's changing every single day, adversity is, you know, piling up. What are a couple of things that you can leave our entrepreneurs and our leaders with for that? I think uh, a, a thing that I tend to do is I always try to think if, if some, like if someone was to make whatever you're about to make, like you're about to make something, how would I beat it? So <laughs> just to ask yourself that, how would I beat myself if I actually did that? Yeah. And then, yeah. and then, and then you'll say, well, I would do this and then say, well, how would I beat that? And, but what if I did this and then no, nope, no, nope, how would I beat that? And you just do that until you're exhausted. Yeah. And I'll give you an example with my last company. Um, we were looking at everything with streaming movies, books, music, um, television shows, everything was going that direction, but not video games. And so Weird. the thought was, well, hold on, on your mobile phone, you're going to have access to every song ever ever recorded, every movie ever made um, at some point in the future. So why wouldn't you have access to every video game ever made? Um, what would it take to complete that? And so um, we sort of, the, the iterations of it, you end up with, I want everything everywhere instantly was the way we phrased it. So everything yeah. everywhere instantly, how would you do that? Um, and the answer is you can't be downloading it. That takes too long. You have to have it start instantly in the cloud and be delivered to any device and be reconfigured correctly for any device. Um, so we just started building that. And, and when you start building towards the future, um, you'll find a lot of people want to work with you on that because that's kind of exciting and interesting. And you'll find companies um, like I had a conversation with PlayStation at one point and I said, are you in the hardware business or the gameplay business? And it's a very, it's a question that, that, that they're not really being asked. But if you think about the question, that the consoles are being made to allow them to sell game experiences. Yeah. And the consoles, in a way, limit the um, ultimate creativity of the, of the developers to what is, because there's a price point, let's call it $500. After $500, you can't charge more. Yeah. So, so you've got to always have a $500 experience. Um, what if I could give you a $10,000 experience from the cloud? Um, would you, you know, why, it would just change the whole paradigm, right? Because right. they're always designing to the to minimum possible um, cost. And so, and then the designers do an unbelievable, and the engineers do an unbelievable job of squeezing every little yeah, ounce out of that hardware. Yeah. Um, so it sort of just changes that paradigm. And I think that ultimately in the long term, you're going to get some experiences from the cloud that you just can't you can't do for $500 and that will be the end of it. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's just an example anyway, is to keep thinking, how would I beat it? And, and I call it end of the track thinking at some point, if you look down the track, how far can you go? Um, and the analogy is the reason I say it about the track is because whatever industry you're in, everyone tends to be on the train together. So everyone's on the train and we're in the industry, we're all doing the thing. Um, and there's people who missed the train that are chasing after it. So they're trying to catch up. And then there's people trying to look look down the track, like what's next? Well, you know, they're, they're trying to innovate. And so I think in just about every industry, the first thought I have is how could I make it easier and faster and save people time? I, yeah. I, I, I see just about every industry is disruptable when you put those glasses on. Like yeah. people, 
time. By the way, that's what we learned from the video game industry is people will pay the most to save time. Yes, so nice you want to walk? Yep. Yeah. Do you want to walk or you want to ride the horse? Out comes the credit card, right? Like <laughs> I don't want to, I want to ride. I don't want to walk anymore. Walking sucks. It's taking forever to get anywhere in this place. Um, and so then you go, but do you want to fly? And it's like, wait, wait, you can fly. <laughs> yeah. Right? Charge me double. I mean, that's, yeah. No, nah, yeah. I want to fly. Um, and so in every way, um, every time in a game, we find a way to help people pro feel progress faster, feeling more productive, using their time better is when the credit cards come out. Yeah. And so um, I think you find that in every industry, the yes, same, the same thing. Yeah. I mean, I really like your, your train kind of picture that you've set there too. And I think in my mind, the disruptors are the one laying the tracks right in front yeah. of that train, right? You're not even on the damn train. Like you're in front of it and you're 15 steps ahead, which is a very cool place. Cool, but scary to a lot of people. I think that's why you see certain personalities in that disruption area of things and others are too damn scared to even get near it. Right. They're like, I'm staying on this train. I'll see where it goes, but I want everyone else to go first. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm comfortable. This is I'm in first class on this train. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to get it. Right. That, that, yeah. that, that's the analogy. It's kind of fun. Yeah. But I mean, if you can be laying the tracks, then you get to, you get to chart the course, which I think is, it sounds like what you're doing a lot with your, with your new product, right. Or with your new platform which is fantastic. So tell people again, where they can, where they can find you and where they can find the platform. So our platform is called Caro. It's at getcaro.com. So that's get C A R R O.com. If you have a Shopify store that sell it, that has a decent amount of sales, you have to have over $5,000 a month in sales. Um, then you can join our network and start partnering with endless brands. And, um, and so if you do that, please email us at hello at getcaro.com and tell us about this podcast. And this is where you came from and we will take really great care of you. Nice. So please nice. do tell us. Love you. Love you. And, and we'll make sure to link the website as, as well as David's LinkedIn, which I have as well in the show notes. So you guys can kind of follow the journey too, because I think it's going to only get more interesting um, as the years pass for your platform. I think you're right. I think you're on the right trajectory with everything. So David, thank you so much for being here with me today. No, thank you for inviting me.